Hello, good morning. Hi, everyone. Hey, everyone. I hope that you had a nice evening yesterday and you have the energy for the next day of the DevOps conference. Welcome again. Uh, I'm here today with my colleague, Bartek. Hi, I'm Bartek Gerlich. I'm head of engineering at Grand Parade, which is a part of a larger company called William Hill. Exactly, exactly. So Bartek works uh, for us uh, in this engineering part. And uh, here locally, we have Grand Parade uh, company, which is uh, the part of William Hill, as Bartek said. And William Hill is the company based in the UK, our um, global, global uh, company. And my name is Tomek, Tomek Manugiewicz. I'm a general manager of uh, Krakow site uh, here locally. And um, today we would like to talk about uh, producing software and why do we write the same solutions again and again and again. Right, yeah. We'll talk a bit about the general idea and by no means this talk won't be totally prescriptive. We won't give you a wondrous way of actually writing better software, doing something that's actually innovative. We'll just talk about problems that we had and maybe some ways that we found are helpful for us when it comes to addressing them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So there will be two parts, actually three parts of this talk. The first part will be my introduction to the general topic, why we, um, we invent uh, similar things in the different regions of, of uh, our globe. Uh, I did some research on that and I'm curious about this uh, root cause aspect of it. Bartek will uh, tell you something about the, uh, our example from our company and in the end I believe we will have some discussion. If, yep. you like to. if you're willing to talk. Yes. Um, so, starting, as I said, I did a little bit of research about this phenomenon that uh, some people invent similar things in the different regions in the same time, actually, in the same time frame. And this, um, this uh, term is called multiple discovery or simulta simultaneous invention. Basically, the, as, as simple as it is, inventing the same thing in two different regions. And, uh, we have, when we see a problem, we would like to solve it and we have some initial conditions. And those initial conditions are basically problems itself. But we have some experiences that we gain all over the world. We have some motivation uh, to solve the problem and uh, we have some ideas, the prerequisite that people uh, find out before us, uh, before our, uh, our um, time on this planet, I would say. So all the legacy that we are um, taking from, from uh, previous uh, people. And also there is a, an, another aspect, the secret sauce of inventors. So the genius that people have, uh, IQ, but not only IQ, in general, the ideation uh, thinking, and it can be various from person to person. And there are also two uh, aspects, the chance and the moment in time, and this is very crucial when it comes to the uh, the inventors that you need to have you, you need to be lucky basically to uh, to be on time with your solution. And why do we invent the same things? Because we have the same we read read the same books, we watch the same movies, we learn about similar things. Nowadays it's easier when we have the internet, uh, right? Because we have immediate access to um, the the knowledge and uh, knowledge is shared across the globe. Before that, before the internet, that was more difficult, but people were, were traveling, were learning from each other. So it ends up going down to the similar roads of solution. And here is the very simple model that you can find the resource below. It's how we create uh, things. Obviously, there are a lot of different processes described, but the main idea is basically the same. You need to have the goal at the beginning or the problem to solve. You need to gather some data, some input uh, about this problem. There's a third step which is to clarify the challenges, to so clarify everything that you'd like to solve. The fourth one is generate ideas, and that's the aspect of innovation. Then prototyping, when you have ideas, you need to prototype. 
plan and action, plan for action, pl plan for implementation, and then evaluation at the end. Does it work or not? And for those of you who are uh, from uh, uh, technical universities, I guess most of, our, uh, uh, most of us are, uh, here is the uh, simple comparator uh, scheme uh, that uh, presents the logic that we usually program uh, on a daily basis. So we have the goal, we have the comparator, which I will talk a little bit about later. We have the input function, so all the input parameters, and then we have effect of, on the environment, so some different business regulations, business uh, perspective. Uh, also, we have some discrepancies, disturbances in the middle, and uh, input function, perception about the current situation, so this is the feedback loop. And goal and perception about current situation is the comparator. A comparator compares those two elements. As simple as that, uh, for those of you who are studying automation, the EU, I guess you remember by heart this diagram. So basically, element uh, G, element uh, object G, object H, the comparator signal input uh, to the object G, and then comparing uh, with, uh, with the feedback loop from object H. So as simple as that, input logic output. That's pretty much it, right? And when we see there is also this feedback loop of this mechanism that we, that algorithms or, or controllers learn uh, in the iterative mode. So input, I mentioned problem, experiences, motivation, prerequisites, all the things are input ideas. That's pretty stable, I guess, uh, no matter where you are on the globe. You have the same challenges, similar motivation, and prerequisites. Then you have this logic part. And uh, logic, our brain, or the CPU in the computer, they are also pretty, works in the similar way. They have some uh, gates, logic gates. We have some neurons inside our brains. But uh, we have similar alg algorithms all over the world, in our brains or in the computer. And how we can have the different outputs if the process is so, so, uh, so simple and so easy? Different outputs is because of this uh, feedback loop. Because during the feedback loop, at exactly during this interpretation part of the feedback loop, at the right-hand side, uh, the unique part is a genius, chance, and moment in time. So where we are and how uh, innovative we are, we can interpret those, th those data coming from feedback loop in a different way, but this is a slightly different way. I mean, that's, uh, that's why we, uh, we have uh, similar inventions. And those are the examples that I found on the uh, websites. Uh, about the inventors or uh, inventions that were invented in the same, in the similar time frame. So calculus in the maths, uh, calculus theory. Oxygen was invented by um, two people around the same time. Uh, natural selection, uh, that we tend to think that Darwin is, uh, is the godfather of it. There, there was another person. I will show you in a, in a second. Uh, photographic methods and color uh, photography that was also invented by two people at the uh, similar uh, time frame. Polio vaccine, which is really important nowadays because we are speaking about vaccinations uh, all the time, and uh, polio vaccine also uh, was invented by two people. And last but not least, very inter interesting for me, neutrons have the mass. That's the invention that also two people invented. Here are the details of it, um, so you can find the dates, you can find the names. I think that the most important is uh, Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallens about the natural selection, mm, uh, and also the polio one. So John Salk and Albert Sabin invented the polio vaccine. Uh, so I will leave you uh, to, um, to, 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 to uh, give some space to Bartek with some quotations from the uh, lawyer, the professor Mark Lemley, uh, from 2011, that Edison didn't invent the light bulb. He found a, uh, found a bamboo fiber that worked. That was the first uh, quotation that he said. The second one, that the inventor of the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell, filled his pater, uh, gave this patent uh, hours before Alicia Gray. That's interesting as well. And German physicist teacher uh, Jonathan Reis, 
built a working telephone a couple of decades before Bell, but nothing came out of it. And actually, I remember one more example with the, um, with the phones, with the smartphones, that I believe that uh, Microsoft uh, invented smartphone way before uh, iPhone uh, was born, but it was about, I guess, the moment in time and the market. That's the example of, uh, of the invention of light bulbs. Uh, so uh, slightly different models, as I said, slightly different uh, ideas, but the concept is generally the same because of this, this feedback group. All right, and so now cool. uh, pass it to Bartek. Yeah, now it's my turn. Hi, everyone. OK, so I'll talk a bit about our experience at William Hill and Grand Parade when it comes to this idea of innovation, of creativity, of building something new. And more specifically, I'll start about talking about well, building something that's the same. There is a term that's pretty popular on the internet right now. It's called carcinization. It basically means that everything in nature finally ends up as a crab or looking like a crab. The reason behind that being is the general body model of a crab has been created in the natural evolution in several different places, I think five or six to be more specific, in the general tree of life. They all basically look like crabs, but in general have less to do with each other than more. So obviously all of them also have different specializations. They, have, they are able to adapt to more or less different environments, but the thing is we see that the same family of crabs, or you know, that has nothing to do with the other family, can do it just as well. That is, they can also adapt and they can also create variations of themselves later to fit different environments. And although they all ended up as crabs, unfortunately, or fortunately for them, depends how much you like crabs, I guess. So why am I speaking about it? Because I think that our crab at William Hill was something that we refer to differently in different places, but it was more or less a set of reusable components and a baseline or a framework for a website that we have used several times and we liked it so much that we have built it three times. This whole concept, completely separate. We have something called Verticals, which is basically a website that more or less does the same thing, that is serves gambling content, because if you don't know, William Hill is a gambling company in the UK. And to serve those, we've built our own crab, that is three different web application frameworks that we have used throughout our sites. We've also managed to upgrade those three different frameworks from Angular to React because that was quite helpful, obviously. More and more work has been put into building each and every one of them. We tried to differentiate them. We tried to make them something, each one, to be something unique, but at the end of the day, to be completely honest, they all met more or less the same criteria, had more or less the same requirements, and basically achieved the same goals. So, why? Where did, where did it come from? Why did we actually? build something that, you know, three times wasting time, having something that's boring for pe doing something that's boring for people and not really, you know, be innovative, not really create something new. I think one of the reasons was this, and I'm not saying that agile or dashboards or measuring your performance is actually something that's bad. What I'm saying is we, especially we in this part of the world, have moved into the, the direction of being more and more productive, of having technical teams to build, to deliver more and more every sprint, every month, every cycle, however you work, that somewhere in that drive we've actually also lost something else from the process, and that something is creativity. So is it bad to be productive? Shouldn't we measure our productivity? Shouldn't teams actually start working towards, you know, achieving more and building better? Obviously not. 
there is really no way for us to deliver software if we're not <laughs> building it. We do have to sit down, we do have to program, we do have to start building something when it comes to actual, doing the actual work. However, at the end of the day, it cannot be all that. So with the problems that we had in our company, I stipulate that a lot of them were caused by this drive to productivity, which ironically made us less productive because it made us build the same things three times. So having a bit of space or creating a bit of space for yourself, for your teams, for your organization to not only be focused on creativity, uh, sorry, productivity, but also be focused on creativity is something that I found lacking when I joined. And I think that we've managed to push it a bit further and get it somewhere where this is also an aspect of the software development lifecycle. So another question is, so maybe we should all just do productivity or focus on it. Well, productivity is good. It's not the only thing as mentor, sorry, uh, creativity. Pro uh, creativity is good. It's not the only thing that's, you know, mentioned that has to be, but that has to be done. So at the end of the day, there are situations, obviously, like let's say in our area of interest, solving incidents or trying to get a production site running again if something goes wrong, where creativity and searching for a more creative solution to do that maybe is not the best idea, right? You do have to focus on productivity. You do have to focus on getting stuff done. The question is to find the right balance between the two things. So now a bit about how to try to be more creative. So uh, as your team, as yourself, I probably don't have, as I said, a prescriptive way of doing it that will work for everybody. So I'll just speak about a bit myself, how I approach this process and how I do it, especially in the area of software development. And I'll focus on that one purely. Uh, I won't really talk about anything else. So, or any other aspect of creativity. So the first one and the most important one is time. And what do I mean by that? I don't only mean that, you know, you have to have time to engage in creative process. That's kind of obvious. If you don't have time, then you're not going to do it. What I'm talking about is creative process is not only difficult, but also kind of disturbing. And especially at work and especially at our work, there will always be something to do, like some easy productive tasks, like this candy that we can have and say, hey, we're done, we have done something, we have replied to this email, we have completed this ticket, we have, I don't know, cleaned up a test that hasn't been cleaned up in a while, there's somebody messaging on Slack, uh, us on Slack that needs help, maybe our colleague needs questions, so uh, needs some questions to be answered. So having time, having time that is being saved for that one particular process or saved like an hour or an hour and a half, which is the time that I would say I would suggest at minimum to be saved by it, that has a starting start and finish is something that has helped me immensely. This is the time that I am focusing on trying to sit down and trying to quieten down and just focus on thinking on the problem at hand on the solution that I have to build, something that I have to design, a process maybe it doesn't even have to be software, but as I said, I'll focus on software. So this time in the beginning when you start, as I said, it's kind of a disturbing process for us, especially if we're used to doing stuff that is quick and productive, because at the beginning it doesn't really give us much. So I would say the first 15, 20 minutes is always kind of a period, at least for me, when I am still distracted. I'm still thinking about the work that I'm trying to be doing. I am still, still thinking about the tasks that I have in today's day, that I have been doing before, maybe something that I have to plan, put on my calendar, cancel, move, and so on and so on. So that is why I suggest that it should be a bit longer than half an hour, for example, because you won't have enough time to do it. And then, only then, after a certain, you know, quieting down period, as I call it, for myself, for my own sake, 
uh, you know, you can actually start thinking and you can actually start working on a solution. Next one is uh, actually the two, two other ones are connected and this is also something that may be more mine than some of yours, but I do like working in a group, especially when thinking about ideas. I do see a lot of benefit of sitting down with somebody and throwing ideas off of each other, discussing a, or doing a whiteboard exercise where we try to get to something together. I think I personally get much further with that than being alone, although due to COVID, for example, I did have to do a lot of work solitarily in the last year and a half. And this too, so collaboration and openness and safety. So especially when you are working with people and you want to work with people, you have to make sure that everybody feels open about their ideas and they feel safe, that they are not going to be criticized, their ideas are not going to be laughed at. And that counts especially for more junior colleagues. So I don't know, if, you know, as you progress further with your career as a software developer in management, doesn't really matter. You get to a point where people value your opinion. And a lot of times, even stating your opinion or even saying something actually stifles creativity because the more junior people will be afraid to bring up their ideas if they're different from you. So make sure that you are different from yours. So make sure that, or at least I am making sure, to be open and try to coax others to give you the ideas first because you start throwing out yours, your ideas first. And now, the last one, and that's also like kind of a trap when you're looking or thinking about it, is it's very rewarding to do something fast. It's very rewarding to just get to something and catch on something very quickly, get it done, get it completed, get that design in or solution definition, as we call it at Hills, get the, uh, get the structure of the program documented, send it over to the team so that they can do the work or do the work yourself if, you know, that is what you are doing at your place. And that is always, unfortunately, a trap because the first solution is often not the best one. Sometimes it can be. I'm not saying that it isn't a stroke of genius from time to time when you come up with something brilliant from the get-go, but a lot of times it isn't. And a lot of times, us looking at this solution, the same one that somebody else has thought of first, because as Tomek has mentioned, a lot of us come from the same backgrounds, we had similar educations, we will come in the first order of business to the same solutions as everybody else does. And then we end up with three web application frameworks that are reusable that never were, because everybody has thought of the same solution everybody has built them the same way because they defaulted to the first one or a lot of times maybe some of the other issues that i mentioned maybe the more junior colleagues that are better or more innovative ideas never could speak so looking at it from that direction i would say that the time safety and openness collaboration and give yourself the again time or you know put solutions together compare them before you start jumping to the first one that comes into your head because it might not be the best one. So next one, and that is something that helps me as head of engineering uh, professionally. You can try more, implement it in your teams or in your organizations. Uh, so a lady, Teresa Amabio, uh, has uh, written a paper, I think, she has been writing papers on creativity and creativity in organizations and enterprises since the early 90s. And uh, she has basically mentioned three areas that we can use to try to build up or try to help out creativity in your organization. So the first one is kind of obvious. So the first one is expertise. So expertise is something that in an organization is inherently connected with creativity. Like, 
personally, for example, it also has an impact. I would say this is the level of entry, so more so to speak. When researching creativity, it has been found out that creativity is in no way correlated to intelligence. So when looking, for example, at architects, you would see that the people that are considered by their colleagues, by their peers as the most creative ones, do not really diverge when it comes to intelligence from the rest of the group. So likewise with intelligence, so obviously you do have to have a certain level of it, and you do have to get to a certain level to be creative, but it's you know, more of a cutoff than something that basically exponentially increases your creativity, likewise with expertise. So in an organization, there is a level of knowledge and there is a level of expertise in the subject at hand that you are trying to address that is necessary for that organization to be created. So if you reach that level, and you get deeper and deeper into knowing what you are talking about, it necessarily does not include in influence your creativity further. It's basically a cutoff. You do need to be an expert, or the organization needs to have expertise, but later on when you reach a certain level, and unfortunately nobody knows what that level is, because it varies from place to place, but if you reach that level, putting more time into getting even more experts, into getting even more knowledge, does not really help you create anything new and innovative. The second part does, so creative thinking. So having an organization that actually is focused on the idea of creative thinking, whether through an exercise like you know the ones that I'm taking, like taking an hour and a half off to focus on creativity, having workshops, having time saved for your teams so that they have spaces or for your colleagues or for yourself, that they have spaces to work on creativity is necessary. And now, how to achieve this creative thinking is the third level. So the third level is motivation. And motivation is a pretty broad subject here because it could be personal motivation, as in getting the right person for the job, somebody that's interested, that wants to do this particular thing. But it also could be an organizational motivation, having enough resources in the organization. There's nothing more stifling to creativity if you, know, you have a team that's starting to build something and, for example, they say, well, we need a AWS account because we want to experiment, we want to play around, and I'll talk a bit about it in a second, about playing. We want to experiment, we want to play around, and somebody says, no, it's too expensive, or no, we cannot do that because of security reasons. Lacking of those resources is demotivating and basically takes away the motivation from your team. Again, promoting creativity, that's what I already mentioned, and also having certain processes or structures in the company that are actually conducive to getting that creativity out, supporting it, and making sure that from the idea to a product, you'll have a way of actually transferring this creative spirit, something that has been designed and thought of, into a, let's say, client-facing application. So, and now the last thing that I'm just going to talk about rather than have a slide on, because it's more of a feeling, so to speak, oh, sorry, than anything else, it's basically, Playfulness. So I think that in the creative process, the whole idea, especially within software development, of playing with your solutions, of having enough time and putting the effort to do a POC, to test something, to run a, you know, maybe a stupid idea, maybe just, you know, a piece of useless code that is able to spawn other pieces of useless code that rather tests concepts, allows you to play and experiment, experiment as in have fun with a solution rather than put together a scientific experiment. I think that's crucial. I think building up those particular aspects of an organization that actually supports the idea that a developer has a chance to rather Play with, a, play with the code, play with the language, play with the tools that they have been given 
rather than just complete productive tasks is something that's necessary for us to be a creative organization. And again, unfortunately, with our drive towards productivity, this is what I think we've lost. I think that looking at building more, looking at delivering quicker, those are the first things that unfortunately go. And not only they go because there is some sort of an evil boss that's looking at your shoulder and saying, well, you know, you have to deliver quicker, you have to deliver quicker or we'll fire you. It's more, as I said, it's really rewarding to do those tasks. It's really rewarding to close things off. It's really rewarding to, at the end of the day, have things done and dusted, have uh, something that's working, that's in production, have a ticket that's closed, have, everybody's, uh, have everybody that's happy, close your day with a let's say, an empty account, a backlog, without, you know, a backlog without anything left on it. And I think those, two, those things that when we've started to look into productivity and when we've started to work like with, for example, different agile approaches, when we started to work on productivity, when it comes to monitoring the team's performance, when it comes to looking at those KPIs, and trying to improve them, trying to improve the time to production. We've lost this crucial aspect that, yes, sorry, yes, productivity is important. Yes, we do need to be productive to deliver something. But at the end of the day, if we focus on only of that, if we focus only on picking items off, we'll end up doing more work rather than less. Giving you the example of our organization, where at the end of the day, we've managed to maybe lose a year of three teams building the same thing over and over and over again. Just because, and as I said, that's my theory rather than a fact, just because we didn't have time to stop, we didn't have time to think, we didn't have time to play around, and we jumped to conclusions, went for the first solution that was available, which was the crap, again and again and again. Cool. All right. And uh, the slide that Bartek uh, showed, the, the mm -hmm. black one, uh, uh, we would like to just leave you with this uh, quotation. Bartek mentioned about having, uh, uh, playing with the technology, having some fun. And uh, this guy, Jeremy Warner, said that even if someone else had the same idea, they didn't have the same story. So I would like to encourage you not to give up when you, for example, think about application uh, and you find eh, there is already a, 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 an app about that. I will not uh, going to do that. Please don't do that. Please make sure that you have fun developing your ideas because even if someone developed the idea before, he or she may not be so lucky as you to, to, to sell an application, for example. And you will have a different story you will uh, get experience, you will learn, you will, <coughs> excuse me, you, you will play with the technology. So this is always, um, always good to, to, to have that. Uh, and, uh, and the last, uh, but uh, not least, uh, before, mm. because we still have some time for questions, is about the urban legend. This is quite funny story. This is not about uh, quotation and facts. This is about the joke that uh, the material nylon uh, came from the material being simultaneously developed in New York and London. That's the, <laughs> that's the, that's the joke that I found uh, yesterday on the web page and wanted to share with you. Hi. So, discussion, questions, anybody would like to raise anything, talk to us about something? I killed them for a fourth one. <laughs> So yeah, we were, looking at, uh, we were looking at different solutions, how to approach the problem. At the end of the day, we are looking at converging them into one application. One of them was called Gaming Common Components. Uh, CWF was our application framework uh, side base also. We are looking into converge them, all of them into one. But at the end of the day, there was so much work and so much, how to put it, attachment that different people have to different pieces of code, which is 
Also something that I find very disturbing when a developer works on a particular piece of code for years, sometimes they find like it's their pet or their baby. And then when another person brings their pet or their baby to the game, they start arguing which one is cuter. And it never ends well. So I thought, and I think that since we are quite successful with the new one, uh, we've decided to take all the requirements that we have and all the architectural work that was done previously and create something new out of that rather than reuse the code itself. So thanks to actually a couple of people that have uh, worked on this for, I think, years right now. Previously, we already had a lot of the architectural work done. We just amended it by our requirements coming from the previous, uh, come, come like a, let's say, greenfield architecture coming from those three frameworks, our applications, what we want to do in the next two years and build something new on top of that. What is important here, I think that also the business people or, or the product people, because we are talking, Bartek is talking about the technology side of it. And there is also the aspect that different product owners or the chief of products can develop the same ideas with the different uh, teams in a different part of the organization. So this is also um, important to make sure that you know you, you challenge your product owner and say, hey, I, I saw this solution somewhere two years ago. Maybe we can come back to that instead of developing from the beginning. Cool. Any more questions that we could, we could help, we could answer? OK. If not. Uh, we are very happy to answer the questions after the talk yeah. as well. If you so we you have a booth. Work. This is the one with the grass. The grass is already falling apart <laughs> because well, may maybe not the best idea, but you know, looks cute. No, looks no, good. I, I think that it's it's already in place and it works. Uh, it <laughs> yeah. will survive. It will survive. But definitely, free, you can yeah, you feel can free check. to visit us if you want to. You can definitely find both of us on LinkedIn. So Bartek Gerlich Tomek Manugiewicz. You can also, if you have any questions about the organization, you can write to us directly or you can write to the address hello at grandparade.co.uk. We'll get the email also and we'll try to answer whether it would be a work query or a technical one. Exactly, exactly. So feel free to, to reach out to us. And today we have some riddles, we have some uh, funny games, uh, the manual games. Swag, on swag. The swag as well. You know, wh so why you, let, let's be honest, come. half of the reasons why we all come to conferences <laughs> is swag. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so thank you very much uh, and cool. have a nice day today. Thank you. Thanks.